today I would like to ponder with you borders and boundaries, bridges and fringes and hems of garments and wings that carry us into the healing rays of heaven. Borders and boundaries, bridges and fringes, hems of garments. We're going to, we heard today in the gospel of uh, someone being healed by touching the hem of Jesus' garment. Now most of the time, we don't see noetically, we don't see the actual energy that exists there. Uh, if we could, oh, we would be living different lives. If we could see the fringes and the, the radiating grace of God that comes in situations, we would be much more alive to the Lord. And so I want to speak about those, and, and because most of the time they, those areas are not visible noetically to our eyes, or to our senses, or to our knowledge, to our noetic knowledge. I want to speak about how they are portrayed, for example, in icons. And the word that is uh, used, you'll often see within an icon, and kind of an almond shape. Well, here it is, right here in the Gospel book. I, you probably can't see this, but there's a blue kind of, almost like a boat, or an almond shape. Uh, we see it on the resurrection icon up here. Uh, wherever two realities come together, like two circles overlap, whenever two circles overlap, that, that space, that overlap, that boundary, uh, that connected place, it's called a mandorla uh, in our iconography. And so we see a mandorla there. We see a mandorla on this resurrection icon. We see a mandorla up here uh, in the Mother of God, more spacious uh, than the heavens. That is to say, she also, with Christ within her, represents two realms that, over, that intersect each other. Y'all with me on that? And that, that intersection forms, uh, in Italian the word, uh, is mandorla. It means almond. And it is this almond shape. You know, in our parish in Santa Fe, in the, in the back apse, uh, where heaven and earth, we, we think of co-joining this way, it forms this almond shape. It's a fish-like shape, too. Uh, you know, that's, the early Christians had that understanding. Because Jesus Christ is God and man. There's this intersection, and the God-man is both human and divine. And uh, always there are these events where heaven and earth co-join, or various other opposites. We think of marriage. Uh, we think of two rings that the husband and wife wear, and they, they intersect. And then uh, they, those almonds, and hopefully our married couples have many little almonds, they're all around us. All the almonds are the, are the uh, manifestation uh, of um, the union of two people, right? You all with us? I notice around um, the church a lot of Trinity signs, um, and there you get, you know, as three persons intersect, you get a uh, little almond shape right there in the center of three persons coming together in one union, one communion, one fellowship, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, unique persons but join together, and in those joinings, in those places, it's a very powerful and sacred space, and from that radiates out lots of divine energy. I was sharing with you just a moment ago, and I got sidetracked by myself, um, that at Holy Trinity in Santa Fe, there is this joining, and it's an almond shape. It looks like a big eye. I love it. And it's, if you can imagine where the mother of God is, it forms an eye, it goes back into the back apse. And very similar to the one you have here, that in the center, that circle in the center where Christ is, he's reaching out in, in ours. His hand goes beyond the boundary, beyond the rim, beyond the border of that circle, coming out, as it were, into our space. 
And so we see that from this, these uh, mandorlas, uh, grace radiates out in yours, and it's on ours too. It's the mother of God, her mantle uh, slips over the boundary of that almond, the boundary of that mandorla, and it slips over the boundary. In this one, in your icon here, Christ's vestment, his hands don't reach out beyond, but his vestment, his, his garment reaches out beyond the mandorla. Do you see that? And how we read that iconically is that the grace of God is coming into our realm and it comes down and it touches the border. Do you see the border that runs along right under her? That's a border between heaven and earth. Here we see Christ below with his disciples. This is an earthly event that takes place there. It's the last supper, the mystical supper down below. And there's a border in between. And, uh, and as you look at it, it's made up of various circles. And the darker ones are the connection uh, between larger circles. As I was standing at the altar today, I noticed, ah, there they are. Here are two circles with the mandorla that joins the two. For the, it's hard to see here, but then little fringes radiating out grace there. Do you see that? Once you begin to see it, you see them everywhere. Everywhere. Heaven and earth are co-joined. And these, these borders are formed. And you want to go there and touch them and get them and feel them and experience them. And even sometimes to suffer the experience because it can be hard sometimes and burnt even fire but that's where you want to be on those those borders you know in the Hebrew the Hebrew word for that border is kanaf the Hebrew word is kanaf and kanaf can be translated border it can also be translated hem like the hem of a garment. It can also be translated wings, like maybe the Philonian feels like the border of the Philonian is like wings. All of those can be legitimate translations of the Hebrew word kanaf. I'm gonna share real quickly, because I wanna to get to the gospel today, which uses, it would translate it hem hem of the garment. Uh, but I want to give you an example of a border that's also a kanaf. And then at the end of the sermon, I'll give you a scripture that speaks of uh, the translation into English as wings. The wings. But it's the same Hebrew word. Y'all with me? Kanaf. What is one that you're all familiar with in the Old Testament uh, concerning borders? Well, it's the story of Naomi, Ruth and Naomi. Do you remember this story? Naomi uh, had two sons. They went up into uh, Moab, and their sons married Moabite women. And both of uh, their husbands, the Moabite men, died. And one of the daughter-in-law went back to her own people. But Ruth, Ruth said to Naomi, her mother-in-law, I'm going with you. Wherever you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Do you remember this story? So beautiful. And they get back to the, to the promised land, to Israel, but they have no husbands and they have no one to work and they, they are dirt poor. And then uh, they remember their kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer is the is the kins the kinsman who is closest to you can redeem you back. It's a, it's an icon. It's an image of Christ. Now, the Jewish law said that the borders of a person's land, especially the corners, but really along the whole borders, 
those who were for the poor and for foreigners, that anyone that needed food at the harvest time could come to the borders and on these fringes of the land they could harvest food to live. Isn't that a beautiful Jewish law? It's amazing. I mean, we should have that kind of thing in our country. We should really have ways where people can work and get their daily needs. Well, in the story, Boaz, uh, the kinsman redeemer, the one who's closest uh, to Naomi, uh, says that Ruth can come and harvest along the borders of his land as much as she needs, that they would survive, and he says to his men, don't touch them and don't hurt them in any way because it's there at that, at that place that the glory of God is revealed. So don't defile them. You with me? Yeah. Okay, so that's the, well, then we know eventually uh, that Ruth and Boaz are married and through them comes the Messiah, the kinsman redeemer. I wish I had more time. We could go into this in much more detail. But I want you to know that they find life in the kanaf, on the edges of the field, and that is written into the law. As I said, I'll, I'll give another one at the end that has to do with the wings. It's translated in English into the wings. But um, for now, let's go to the gospel. And let's hear this gospel. There are two stories I've already talked about how two circles inter intersect. There are two stories going on at the same time. One is a story about uh, Jairus, and Jairus was the, uh, the head of the uh, synagogue, and his daughter is dying, a 12-year-old daughter. And so he comes and he presses Jesus, will you come and heal my daughter? And Jesus says, of course. And so anyone who's been in the ministry uh, knows that, si that situation, that scenario, where a desperate person comes and says, come and pray now, we need you now, it's urgent, now come. And you say, of course I will, because it's, it's fine. I, I have the time and let's go. But here's the difficulty, and when I used to read this as a young priest, this gospel would make me just break out in a sweat because I've seen it and I've felt it and I've experienced it so many times. You're trying to do one thing and then there's something else that's also urgent that comes in. And as Jesus is going to heal Jairus' daughter, what takes place? But a woman who has been bleeding, hemorrhaging for 12 years, for all the years that this little girl was alive, that woman had been bleeding, had been dying, day in and day out. And, and so what you have there, for a lot of people, especially if ministers are, are serving in their own strength, they're going to feel anxious when they're being pulled in two different directions. That's how it can feel, being pulled. And you can feel what I call, and many call, the tyranny of the urgent. The to-do list. To do this now, you gotta do this now. No, you gotta do this now. Now it's this, no, you gotta stop. Ever feel that way? You just don't have enough hands? You, you just don't have enough time? You say to yourself, if only I could bilocate, but then there would be two more doubles, and you would have to do it again, and pretty soon you'd be so fragmented. And so much of the time we on earth experience these difficulties that come into our lives as tyrannical, as, as tyranny. They, they are pulling our attention there, and we feel anxious, and we feel like there's just not enough of me to minister here, to do what is needed. And that's a good place to be, where you come to the end of your own resources. Because rather than seeing these two circles pulling you 
a, a part. As soon as you can see it noetically, as here's two events that God has going on at the same time, and the interaction between the two forms, the mandorla and Jesus Christ is there, and the power of the Holy Spirit is there, and the Father makes his home there, and the borders of that seeming conflict is where the food is. It's where you learn to trust. It's where you touch uh, the hem of heaven. It's where you experience the glory of God. And to, again, use the phrase of St. Gregory, uh, the theologian, Gregory Nazianzus, who said that we are to see and to suffer the splendor of God in those places. To see and to suffer, to experience, to take into ourselves, and to know that God is sufficient for the day. If we could see that at the moment of every conflict of, in this world, that yes, the evil one's at foot, Yes, death is at the door, but God means it for life. The Lord means it for transformation in our lives and in the lives of others around us. And so we see all of those around Jesus as he is completely calm. I've, every time I've preached on this gospel, I can feel my own anxiety, but if I, if I reach out to touch him, I always feel God's calm. He's not all frenzied and worked up. And so he's moving through the crowd. He's being tossed and touched and hustled through. The disciples are saying, we got to hurry. Jairus is saying, come on, my daughter's dying. And all of a sudden, whammo. Somebody touches the fringe of his garment and he feels uh, the power. He feels the connection. He feels the mandorla around him has that, I often think of the mandorla as a door uh, that opens up and the grace of heaven pours out. He feels the energy goes out. And uh, he says, who touched me? Right? And the, and the disciples are like, Master, could we get could we get moving? Like somebody's dying. No, somebody touched me. And he stops. I, you know, bum, 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 bum. Everybody, boom. When he stops, all the people behind like, whoa. And um, maybe we should just move on, Pastor. No, somebody touched me. And the, and the woman, she's afraid. But he doesn't want her to be afraid. He just wants to hear her story. He knows something powerful has happened. Heaven and earth have co-joined for a moment, and grace of God has come forth. And that's what Jesus came for. He left heaven, as it were, and joined himself with us so that he would be a bridge between heaven and earth, so that the grace of God would touch us and that we would be transformed and become by grace what he is by nature. That's why the mandorlas are always blue. It's a, it's the sign of heaven. It's the energy, the light of the mother of God. It's the, it's the blue um, life and light of heaven. It's why the sky is blue. I know when little kids, mommy, daddy, why is the sky blue? You know, we try to come up with some, what's the newest scientific explanation, you know, it's because of the mother of God. It's because of heaven. That's why the sky is blue. We don't need any other explanation because heaven is so close to us that God made it blue so we would know. And the earth, the greenness of the earth, we see iconically as the movement of the Holy Spirit renewing everything from the brown earth into life. We have to see, brothers and sisters, we have to learn to see iconically cosmologically, ontologically, to see everything, eucharistically, the joining of bread 
and the Holy Spirit, the joining of heaven and earth, everywhere we will see Mandorlis, doors that open to us where we can taste heaven. And so Jesus listens to this woman very carefully. And he learns of her story. But as that happens, of course, Jairus' daughter dies. And they bring him the news. And again, we've all been in places like, ah, if only I'd hurried more. I have to tell you, I know for certain Jesus Christ is not saying it that time. Oh, Father, if, if only I'd hurried more. If only I had succumbed to the tyranny of the urgent and, and forgot, just let that other woman go or whatever. Because now what can be done? She's dead. No, he's the resurrection and the life. And hope is the assurance. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And he says to have faith. Have faith, your daughter will live. And so they go to the house, and of course, um, they're there in the bedroom. Uh, he, he, he brushes out all of the unbelievers and the naysayers, and just a few of them there in that bedroom. And uh, he raises her up. And says, give her food. Give her the food from the border. <coughs> well, there's a lot more that could be said, but I, I've gone on perhaps too long already. So let's just simply say, let our eyes be open to see around us heaven and earth conjoined. To see the Son of Man. The one who joins two different realms, the uncreated with the created, and forms a mandorla that is all about life and resurrection, that says in the face of death, you cannot last. Weeping may last the, the night, but joy eternal comes in the morning. And so to end with that beautiful passage from Malachi, chapter four, verse two, and for those who revere my name, says the Lord, for those who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, in his kanaf. For all who revere my name, says the Lord, the sun of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And Matthew's gospel goes on to say, it was not just that one woman who touched his fringe, the hem of his garment, and was healed. Matthew's gospel, chapter 14, verse 36 says, and all who touched the fringe of his garment were healed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen.